Well, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Thorny Island uh, talk. Um, I'm Sue Ball, um, the chair of the Thorny Island Society. I'm managing the technology uh, is Jules Chalabé, who also organizes all our marvelous talks. So thank you, thank you, Jules. Um, I'd like to welcome all of our members and to any non-members this evening, just a reminder, and I hope you'll go to our website and become a, become a member uh, too. Um, but before I introduce our speaker, I'd just like to uh, remind you that our last talk in this current um, uh, season is on Thursday, which is a different day for us, a Thursday the 29th of July. Um, when I'm really thrilled that our Thorny Island member Michael Marriott subject um, will be caring for the poor and vulnerable on Thorny Island. So uh, please do uh, book for that too. Uh, but back to this evening, I mean this talk was originally planned as a visit to the RHS Lindy Library on Vincent Square and for many of us it's a very near neighbour. Um, so we are especially pleased that Susan Robin, um, RHS librarian, offered to give us a talk instead. Um, so Susan will speak for about an hour, followed by Q and A. Um, so if you could put your questions into the chat, uh, Jules will facilitate the question and answer session um, at the end. Uh, Susan has been a librarian at the RHS for um, six years. And her special role is actually huge. It's outreach to the public and to provide access to the RHS collections and promote the huge array of content held by the RHS and to show how the RHS influences knowledge um, on a broad range of subjects. And many of the images that Susan is going to show us are works of art in their own right, as well as being scientific and technical studies. So Susan has a huge role and we're thrilled she is giving us a special look at the RHS incredible collection. Over to you, Susan. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for asking me to, to sit, um, talk to you. As Sue was saying, it was planned as a visit and it would have been lovely to see you all at the library. Um, so this talk is a little bit different than what I would have shown you if you had visited because you would have been pouring through the books. Um, as it is, I've done that myself and got some lovely photographs of the material and hopefully this gives you a deeper insight into the collections that we hold in the RHS related to food. So this is the incredible edible RHS. If first of all, if I could just ask you if you could um, change the view on your cameras um, to speaker only and move your screen to the top right corner, then it, you, the video shouldn't interfere with the slides at all. I'm gonna share my screen. And there we go. So hopefully now I'm just a little talking head up in the right hand corner of your screen and you can see the PowerPoint in all its loveliness now. So the RHS, the Horticultural Society to begin with, was founded in 1804 and from the outset food growing and particularly fruit was a central concern. This tour will explore how the society aimed to support and enrich the commercial growth of food in the UK through defining fruit varieties, funding plant collecting expeditions, collecting horticultural knowledge from both the past and the present, and sharing that knowledge with the nation. The turn of the 19th century was a time of innovation, driven by a boom in fina national finance, scientific and technological advancements, and travel. John Wedgwood led the creation of a private learned society that could pull together the emerging horticultural information from across the UK, examine it and share the positive discoveries with horticulturalists while supporting these new ideas with the backing of scientific authority. The society also looked to promote the advancement of horticultural science where possible by publication and funding. 
Of particular interest to the members was the identification and improvement of fruit and vegetables. It's quoted in the transaction for publications of the society. The execution of their plan, the society feel that they may have many difficulties to encounter and some prejudices to contend with, but they have long been convinced as individuals, yet there scarcely exists a single species of esculent edible plant or fruit, which relative to the use of man has yet attained its, most ut its utmost state of perfection, nor any branch of practical horticulture, which is not susceptible to essential improvement. This is a screenshot of the founders of the RHS. There's really one founder and then the others are founding members. And they were quite big hitters of their time. And they were a mix of gentlemen gardeners, such as John Wedgwood and Charles Greville, the explorer, Sir Joseph Banks, gardeners, William Ayton and William Forsyth, um, commercial seedsman, James Dixon, and botanist and author, Richard Salisbury. The Society chose not to commit itself to regular publication, but to occasional articles for members. These transactions proved to be very popular and were later produced as yearly collections. So if through the presentation you see a date for an article is very different to the date that I've quoted, it's because it was collected and then republished. Articles were submitted from across the UK by corresponding members, typically estate owners or their head gardeners and discussed a number of topics, including the history of horticulture, scientific observations and experiments, and details of new and existing plants. By far the most regular contributors to the transactions were Sir Joseph Banks and Sir Thomas Knight, a passionate horticulturalist and president of the RHS from 1811 to 1838. In the 1840s, the RHS chose to produce a regular publication the Journal of the Horticultural Society, which continues today as our members magazine, The Garden. So the image here of the contents page, this is taken from the very first transaction, the first um, collection of articles. The introduction remarks um, relative to the objects which the Horticultural Society have in view really sets out what their plan is, what it is they're going to cover. And that was written by um, Thomas Knight, who's very, very influential across the RHS. But it also shows you the variety of articles that they would um, publish and look into. The second article, an attempt to ascertain the time when the potato was first introduced into the United Kingdom. You also have another historical article by Sir Joseph Banks at the bottom on the revival of an obsolete mode of managing strawberries. So they were looking backwards as well as forward, looking at the past to see what they could learn for the future. There's also an article by Thomas Knight, observations on the method of producing new and early fruits. Fruits more than vegetables were their focus because they were considered more delicate. And these, this was a gentleman's club. It was a, a badge of learning to have a fruit garden and to be able to um, experiment and such. The society was also very interested in exotic fruits with the advances in glass and heating technology which could be brought in from abroad. They appointed a series of plant collectors to travel the world and amongst the plants and seeds they sent back were exotic fruits, although a lot of it was also very beautiful flowers. Details with drawings were published in its transactions. An article about fruits sent back to the society by one of its plant collectors, George Don, a distant ancestor of Monty Don, details just over 30 exotic fruits that Mr. Don had recorded growing in Sierra Leone. Amongst them was the pineapple. Joseph Sabine, the, so the society secretary summarizes, the profusion in which these plants are found in both frequented and unfrequented places sanctions the opinion, which is commonly entertained in the colony, that they are not of foreign origin, but indigenous inhabitants. This is contrary to the doctrine of scientific botanists who hold that the pineapple have been carried from America into Africa and Asia. Yet it is difficult to conceive how such an exotic could have so established itself as to assume all the habits and characters of a native in those regions. 
Pineapples do originate from South America, but they were imported across the Atlantic into Europe and West Africa in the, from the 1600s by the Portuguese. The environment in West Africa is so suited to pineapples that the Ivory Coast now supplies 60% of the European market and is second only in world production to Costa Rica. So a little bit of history to be learned there as well. Once exotic fruits and other plants were returned, the important thing was to perfect growing them so they could appear on the employer's table, ideally all year round. For centuries, the pinnacle was the pineapple. They were a status symbol. They were prohibitively expensive to purchase and grow, and the larger your gardener could grow them, the better. It was competitive growing. But what you get inside, you lose in flavour. At this time, people could hire a pineapple to be the centerpiece of the table decoration at your grand dinner as a fashionable talking point and a show of wealth. The same way people have ice sculptures at events today. I've also read that they represent hospitality, which may explain why you can find stone ones on Lambeth Bridge and in Lambeth Palace. Possibly, I'm not sure, but it makes sense to me. The society were also keen to promote and recognise homegrown fruit varieties. The article on your right is from 1816 and records the introduction of the pair Williams Bon Chrétien. This pair appears to have sprung up from seed in the garden of Mr Wheeler, a schoolmaster of Aldermanston in Berkshire, about 20 years ago, and was suffered to remain in order to prove the value of its fruit. Subsequently, grafts have been extensively dispersed and many trees are now Mr Williams' nursery and other gardens around London. This pair I would recommend to the notice of the Horticultural Society as superior to any of its season to which I am acquainted. The Bon Chrétien and the Conference pair are the two most common pairs that you will find in the supermarket today. And this was, we we'll say the botanic introduction of it for a plant to be accepted um, in the Horticultural Society as scientifically, it needs to have um, been written down twice, so two printed references, and it used to need to have an illustration as well, so this would count as such. In the article, they say that this appears in somebody's garden, so I would assume the seed was somehow dropped. The pear did exist long before. It's not a new variety, but it's the identification of it as a particular variety that makes it a point here. This article and drawing was submitted by William Hooker, the botanical artist. In 1814, the Society's first important research programme aimed to reduce the synonymy, the same thing called by different names, in fruit varieties by means of a set of accurate reference drawing of named varieties. William Hooker was the first, art first artist employed by the Society to paint fruit varieties in an extensive project that lasted from 1815 to 1823. Many of the featured specimens were supplied by members. Over 200 paintings by Hooker and other artists make up this early collection, a collection that has become known as Hooker's Fruits. You might have heard that in a commercial term. Uh, many of the varieties of these beautiful paintings no longer exist. I think it was in the 1990s, the RHS brought out um, teacups, teapots, things like that, plates, with a series of hookers fruit designs on them. A representative fruit drawing depicts the fruit as it is found on the plant, with a portion of the branch leaves and blossom, plus a cross section of the fruit. Since the decision to initiate the project was taken in May 1814, and the drawings in the first volume are dated 1815, we infer that the fruits were first drawn, generally speaking, in the autumn, and the details of flowers and foliage added the following spring. William Hooker completed 138 of the 200 drawings until he suffered a stroke in 1820. He was succeeded by other artists, Charles John Robertson, Barbara Cotton, and Augusta Innes Withers. Altogether, 10 volumes of drawings were compiled, nine devoted almost exclusively to fruit. The fruit drawings were regarded as one of the glories of the society, even in its early years. Excuse me. 
and a preface to the third volume of transactions in January 1820 drew attention to them. The collection of drawings, sorry, the collection of drawings of fruits formed under the direction of a committee is already cool, and by a perseverance in the plan proposed, it will ere long surpass all others. In point of numbers, as much as already does in point of excellence. In justice, they cannot admit to state that the correct, correct eye and skillful hand of Mr. William Hooker, the artist regularly employed by the society, they own this invaluable assemblage. Their importance of which as standards of reference will long be felt and acknowledged. The programme was only suspended when the society developed its own living collections of fruits at its experimental garden in Chiswick in 1822. <coughs> This portrait is of the Chile strawberry. It is named in reference to Chile, the country. Strawberries, as we enjoy them today with cream or champagne, are not native to Europe. They've been cultivated by breeding the white Chile strawberry with the red scarlet strawberry from the state of Virginia. Both of these strawberries are considered native to their areas, but that can always change with history, with researching history. They were collected and arrived separately in France where the taste of the white strawberry and the size of the red strawberry were bred together and a summer classic was made. European strawberries are much smaller, but still sweet wild strawberries. The society built up a library from its earliest days as a collecting and sharing of horticultural information was the main purpose of its formation. The society collected historic works for its fellows, staff and students to consult, to learn from past successes and failures, as well as producing and supporting new materials that looked forward to the blending of the art of gardening and the science of botany. This lovely little picture here is taken from an early work called The Orchard and the Garden. Um, I always think it looks today more like a kind of spot the health and safety issues, but it is something that they particularly interested in was grafting of trees and fruit trees. A popular horticultural title is A New Orchard and Garden by William Lawson. This is not the same book, this is A New Orchard and Garden, building on the reputation of the previous and publication. Its full title is much longer, as you can see, all of that paragraph is the title. First published in 1618, this was the standard 17th century text on fruit trees and is the earliest work on gardening in Northern England. It ran to around 15 editions and was quoted at length by John Evelyn in Silver, a 17th century plea to landowners for reforestation. It is frequently reproduced, possibly because Lawson insisted on much care and cost, having the knots and models by the best artisans cut in great variety. So very good pictures. Lawson himself was a Protestant clergyman at Ormsby, North Yorkshire, and this was his only book. Some of the text is philosophical rather than practical or instructional. Perhaps because of his Puritan leanings, Lawson stresses the pleasure profit balance of cultivating a garden and is keen to maximise the return on labour, orchards having a greater yield than any other cultivation. He also stresses that he has a northern orchard and country garden, recognising and advising on climate differences between his own experience and that of gardeners in the south of England. The best known illustration is the idolised depiction of a house with a south facing garden, the picture in the middle, showing shelter belt, shelter belt planting, terracing, beehives and an orchard set in a conquax design an arrangement of five objects at the corners and the fifth in the centre like on a dice, as recommended by classical authors. In chapter one, Lawson recommended hiring a gardener to care for your orchard to get the best out of it. He states, the gardener had not, had not need be an idle or lazy lover, for so your orchard being a matter of such monument will not prosper. There will ever be something to do. Weeds are always growing, moles work daily, in winter, your young trees and herbs would be lightened of snow. Drifts of snow will set deer and hares and other noisome beasts over your walls and hedges into your orchard. <coughs> as well as suggestions on garden design, this was also a practical guide explaining how to graft the perfect fruit tree 
as well as how to deal with pests. He states, your cherries and other berries when they be ripe will draw all the blackbirds, thrushes and magpies to your orchard. The bullfinch is a devourer of your fruit in the bud. I have had whole trees shelled out with them in winter time. The best remedy here is a stone bow, a small crossbow that fires large pellets, a piece, a handgun, especially if you have a musket or a sparrowhawk in winter to make the blackbird stoop into a bush or a hedge. I think that gives a good example of the class of person that this book is aimed at. This is not for gardeners on the ground. This is the owner of the vast country estate. The image in the middle um, is an idealised example of the perfect home and garden. And down the side is coded. So A represents um, your paddock for your horses. A is uh, your orchards, I believe. The interesting thing it has is a drawbridge and a moat. It says if you can have that, that's wonderful. Um, also at the bottom of the page is a river. So being near water is important. And also at the bottom of the page, Next to the little turrets, there's little O's, and that's where you should put your beehives as well. And the, the stripes, if I use my mouse here to point, the little stripes on the pictures here, that's steps. So your house is raised, leading down to the river through your different gardens. So going forward a few hundred years here, the Horticultural Society was very much a gentleman's club with a great emphasis on the needs of the owner and the head gardener of the kitchen garden on a country estate. But over the course of the 19th century, it became more and more interested in the needs of commercial growers. The Fruit Committee was the society's first standing committee founded in 1858 and commercial growers were well represented. An influential member was Robert Hogg, author of the Fruit Manual, the largest and most comprehensive survey of British fruits. Scotsman Robert Hogg initially studied medicine and it was perhaps his scientific training which inspired him to produce his systematic study of fruit which is still used 150 years later. He was a driving force behind the founding of the British Pomological Society and when this was incorporated into the RHS he joined the fruit committee which he eventually chaired. He also became secretary of the RHS and a member of council. Until his death, he was a trustee of the Lindley Library. In 1860, Hogg produced the Fruit Manual, a 280 page guide to the best soft fruit and nuts grown in the UK. By including historical research, Hogg developed the Fruit Manual from a catalogue into an encyclopedia. However, it was his systematic classification of apples using the structural characteristics of the stamen, tube, carpels and sepals which saw it become the standard work for over 100 years. It was so successful, it ran to five editions, eventually expanding to 759 pages and covering 718 varieties of apple. Varieties that have come and gone, but the fruit manual is still used today. The following extract gives a flavor of his approachable style. In describing Shipley's apricot, he says large, oval, skin, deep yellow, flesh yellow, tolerably rich and juicy, ripe in the end of July and beginning of August. It, were it was raised by Miss Shipley, the daughter of a former gardener, to the Duke of Marlborough at Blenheim. With regards to the costard apple, the costard is one of our oldest English apples. It is mentioned under the name of Poma Costard in the Fruiterers Bill for Edward I in 1292. The true costard is now rarely to be met with, but at an early period must have been very extensively grown for the retailers of it were called costard mongers, now transformed to costa mongers. But Hogg's opinions could be as tart as some of the apples he describes. A culinary apple of second rate quality, valued only for its earliness. A worthless apple, ripe in October. I've seen an apple called improved Ashmead's kernel, which is no improvement at all. In 1898, a year after Hogg's death, the RHS instituted the Hogg Medal for Fruit and Vegetables. As a side point for local history, Hogg lived and wrote the fruit manual at 61 Winchester Street, Pimlico, which is about half a mile away from the library. 
The Society's knowledge and research work in the field of food growing led to the Society being consulted by the government. In 1852, the Society's Secretary, John Lindley, was asked by the Analytical Sanitary Commission how best to investigate and report on the adulteration of ground coffee in London. The adulteration of commercial foodstuff was rife in Victorian London and a very real risk to public health, as well as an economically fraudulent act that affected the commercial revenue of coffee suppliers. Lindley determined that we have carefully examined samples of coffee and chicory in different states and there is no difficulty in detecting the mixture, however finely they may be ground, if they be examined under a good microscope. The images in front of you on the left are the images published in the report. The images in the middle are by John Lindley's own hand in his write-up of the report. Examining a range of coffee on sale across London, he found traces of many surprising vegetables amongst the coffee grounds, including peas, carrots and parsnips, but chicory was the main addition. Some other unsavoury additions he had been advised to check for included sand, mahogany sawdust and dried baked horses and bull's liver. Many retailers would mix coffee with chicory on request as it made it more affordable to the poorer class and some customers preferred the darker, stronger taste. Camp coffee, a mixture of coffee and chicory, is still sold today. Um, about the dried baked horses and bullocks liver, which is very unsavoury, um, they say how they can work out these things, are, how you can work out these things are in your coffee as well. So with that, it says if you make your coffee, leave it for a couple of days, it will become very noisome and basically smell of gone off meat. So you know not to go back to that purveyor again. Lindsay used science, the microscope, to prove what was being sold was not what was being advertised. In the first report, only two of about 40 retailers were selling genuine coffee. The retailers were listed anonymously, but alongside the street in which the premises were located, so not quite anonymous to their customers. Three months later, a second report was published where the whole experiment had been rerun. Here Lindley goes on to name and shame the retailers who had not improved their wares. He even goes so far as to, to transcribe the bills, the advertisements, for the establishments that promote the purity of their coffee and the stringent steps taken to assure their customers that they do not sell adulterated coffee. The results? Still adulterated. At the end of his trial, Lizley, Lindley lists those who passed the tests, including Fortnum and Mason. So Fortnum and Mason have always sold very good coffee. The library catalogue has a large collection of national and international nursery catalogues. All catalogues are valuable as they give dated information about which plants are available at a particular date, an important fact both to garden historians and to plant researchers. Long runs have an additional value as they shed light on the development of a company's stock and products and thereby on changes in taste and fashion, while the style and layout of the catalogue can reflect artistic trends. The catalogue in front of you is for Brimwood's Nursery. This is the catalogue in the middle and on the right, sorry, on the left, and is dated 1783. It cost two shillings in wrappers and three shillings bound, an expensive publication. Unlike modern catalogues, which are printed cheaply, produced seasonally and made to be discarded. Catalogues at this date were made to last. So much so that when the nursery moved from Little Chelsea, a hamlet on the Fulham Road, to Kensington, close to the palace, existing catalogues were simply updated by pen and ink. The catalogue lists plants of names only with no descriptions, certainly no illustrations. Your gardener would know the properties and appearance of the plants. This was simply a list of what plants could be purchased. There were also no prices, since such a comparatively expensive publication would need to remain in circulation for years to recoup high production costs, and the owner might need to change the prices before the print run is exhausted. There is therefore little in the way of information exchange between the nurseryman and his customers, and this was something that Grimwood addresses in his preface and acknowledges now needs to change. 
I hope in another year or two to give the public a descriptive catalogue, and he does write that in capital letters, of the various fruits with their qualities, flavours and time of ripening, with the uncertainty of the seasons in this climate make it so difficult to ascertain and frequently causes so much disappointment. The catalogue on the right was published only 10 years later by another London nursery, Maddock and Son, and it offers a coded shorthand description of gooseberries by their colour, ripening time and texture. The number of varieties of fruits in particular is now so fast that descriptions are essential for customers. Stepping forward about 200 years, and nursery catalogues are all about information and visuals. This is a collection that I pulled from, uh, a sample, should I say, that I pulled from our collection. And they're predominantly around the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. We have up here um, a German catalogue, which represents the international aspect of our collection, but it also shows the expectation of images and information for customers was international as well. We have down here a lovely little illustration, um, early 20th century, showing not just what you can buy, but what you can do with your vegetables. You can make a tasty homegrown egg salad. So again, it's more, it's not just description, it's what you can do with it, and it's illustration, it's easy to comprehend. On the catalogue on your right, the Bar Seed, Seed Guide, they are promoting their RHS award on the front of their catalogue as a recognition standard of the high quality of their goods, which is very nice to see. And the other catalogue I'd like to draw your attention to is the Riders PP Seeds. This is 1916, this is during the war. Even so, over one million copies of this catalogue are distributed every year. If you compare that to the Grimmer catalogue, which we just discussed, where you kept that one copy and updated it. They are also distributing penny packets of seeds. That's what the PP is for. And again, if you compare that to um, a couple of year, hundred years earlier, to Grimmer's expensive catalogue and niche wealthy customers, gardening is now for all the people. Talking of illustrations or nursery catalogues, one of the gems of our collection is the album Banari. This album is presented in a handsome red leather slipcase with gold tooling, an image of which we have here. This is what came with the catalogue. This wasn't a private commission. It was purchased by the RHS in 1932 and dates from between 1876 and 86. The album Banari consists of a portfolio containing 28 chromolithographed plates of vegetables drawn by Ernst Banari, the owner of the seed nursery. Each plate is accompanied by an attached leaf containing letterpress listing the names of the varieties depicted. The plates, which you also can't see here, are protected by leaves of tissue paper. They are already considered as they are sold as an artwork and considered as an artwork. The colouring is fantastic, but not quite true to life. In 1843, Ernst Benari set up his nursery in Erfurt, Germany, publishing his first catalogue of seeds and plants in December of that year. Early price lists included local specialities such as China asters, pansies and stocks, but he sold vegetable seeds from the outset, always seeking to improve the quality. By literally speaking the customer's language, these multilingual text um, next to the picture there, he developed a strong customer base across Europe, while his paternalistic and philanthropic approach to his workforce ensured that they remained loyal to the company father to son. So the languages that we have here is Russian, English, French, and also oh, German, English, French, and Russian at the bottom there. Having Jewish connections, the Benari company suffered under the National Socialist Government and at the end of the Second World War found itself in Soviet-controlled East Germany. The company was refounded from scratch by Friedrich Benari, Ernst's son in Hann, London, in West Germany in 1846. With Friedrich travelling all over Europe with his bicycle, 
to collect seed for his new business. Bonari is still an independent German family business, now in its sixth generation and operates three breeding facilities in the USA, the Netherlands and Germany. And these pictures are beautiful. These are available as prints via RHS collections if anybody is interested. If you go to the website, you can purchase some of these images. Sticking with vegetables, Britain's entry into the war did not take the society by surprise. In 1938, a programme of lectures and demonstrations on food growing for wartime were set in motion. The RHS became a member of the Allotments Coordinating Council and advised the LCC, the London County Council, on its allotments programme. In October 1940, it started work on a larger publication entitled The Vegetable Garden Displayed to teach the nation how to grow their own vegetables and supplement their ration book diets. This was published in 1941 with illustration and illustrated with 300 photos and went through eight impressions during the war, selling for most of that time at the price of one shilling. It became by far the society's most successful publication. As expressed in the introduction by the food Minister of Food, feeding ourselves was going to prove a battle. This is a food war. Every extra row of vegetables in allotments saves shipping. If we grow more potatoes, we need not import so much wheat. Carrots and swedes, which can be stored through the winter, help to replace imported fruit. We must grow our own onions. We can no longer import 90% of them as we did before the war. The vegetable garden is also our national medicine chest. It yields a large proportion of the vitamins which protect us against infection. I therefore welcome this booklet, which encourages people to grow more vegetables. The battle on the kitchen front cannot be won without help from the kitchen garden. The photographs of digging and growing in the booklet are taken at Wisley, or were taken at Wisley, I should say. If you've been to Wisley, so I point out here in the broad beams down in the bottom left here, this shot, this house, this is now the location of the new entry to the RHS gardens. So that would be the building with the cherry tree walk as you come through and the shop as well would be there. These images had been put to use as slides for gardening lectures across the country almost as soon as war broke out. Later, they were transformed into traveling exhibition boards sent out to town halls, schools and other public spaces. Amazingly, one set of boards survived the war and turned up more than 60 years later in a scout hut on the Isle of Wight. In 1946, the vegetable garden displayed was translated into German as fresh vegetables throughout the year as part of an effort to help with the reconstruction of the German domestic economy. The networks of market gardens that accompanied most market towns had been destroyed in the situation bombing. Um, they were in a dire state. I think they were actually worse than we were by the end of the war. So reproducing the vegetable garden displayed, it is page for page, word for word. It's an exact copy, um, but translated into German. And again, it was an immense seller. And hopefully it saved a few lives. We're now going to move forward to look at some artworks, some modern botanical art. Every year, the Lindley Library acquires one or two artworks exhibited at the RHS Botanical Art Show. Although the overwhelming majority of artworks in this collection are ornamental flowering plants, there are some beautiful examples of close observation of fruit and vegetables. These artworks show that contemporary botanical artists are increasingly finding fruit and vegetables interesting and beautiful subjects. The style of this artwork, um, which is Thai ginger, is very traditional in that it shows the plant at a different stages of development and separately highlights the smaller details as such as in the seeds. The plant is very tall and the artist uses an accepted device of cutting the stalks to show the height. 
which you can see, there we go, see just there. This also allows the viewer to see inside the plant across via the cross section. This plant was drawn from life and was situated in the artist's back garden in Taiwan. Now the art, the image is actually the whole picture on the left. I have cropped into close detail in the little boxes there. Um, when this artwork was being exhibited, apparently one of our botanists was visiting and was looking at this picture and mentioned the fact that the the dying sections up here of the plants, this isn't the plant dying back naturally, it was very dehydrated. And so the artist has drawn exactly what she saw and what she saw was her Thai ginger plant needed some water. But it's a detail that is scientifically important. This is what the plant will look like when it's dehydrated. You also get the close up view down here in the bottom left corner of the seeds just there. And that is shown that they start on here and then they can fall down. You've also got when the plant flowers detailed here, but it is ginger. So the main focus of the image is actually the roots. And as you can see, the beautifully detailed. And you have the cross sections here. You have all the little tubers running off as well. The artist of this work is Claire McGee and this picture is from a series or collection of eight that she painted for the RHS Botanical Art Show in 2010. This was the first time she had painted vegetables. In discussing the collection she states that the main aim of this series was to show that vegetables that we generally think of as being rather ordinary can possess an extraordinary beauty and fascination when closely studied. With their diversity of shape, colour, size and texture, vegetables are a fascinating subject to paint. Each vegetable is cut in some way to expose the flesh and texture within and painted in detail to show the beauty of each subject. So although this isn't a traditional botanical picture, she doesn't have the different growing processes, it's still very, it's still very, it still counts as a botanical artwork. This is because it is so detailed. This isn't a stylized image. This is scientifically correct. Also with the cut through that she did on the root, uh, not the root, so on the stem there, it shows you details inside in beautiful, you can even see the little fringing there. Also, if you look at the leaves, they have some droplets of water on them. So this is telling you that these leaves are rather thick, perhaps waxy, but they are, they're not delicate. And if you see here, the small drops within the veining, again, that's showing you the depth of the veining of the leaf there. This isn't something very light. This is a very sturdy plant. And it's all very beautiful. Okay, so that is the end of the display. Um, these are my details here. If anybody, we're going to do a QA, and a but if anybody would like to contact the library, um, this is the email address and our telephone number. Also our website. And you can follow us on social media as well. Um, I think that's it. So if I stop sharing now. Okay. Let me go back to you go back to Sue? Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> Honestly, the, the richness uh, um, of the illustrations were, they were absolutely gorgeous. Um, mm -hmm. And I would never have uh, really dreamt that. And, and, and to, to show that the, the growing processes and the accuracy scientifically, you know, was really extraordinary. So, uh, I hope that we can visit you. I hope Jules, as I'm sure she has, has got us sorted out for that. We don't know when we're going to reopen at the moment. That's that's our problem. Um, as things stand, the library is in the basement and the ground floor of the building. And we have an air conditioning system all throughout the basement level, which because of COVID, we're not allowed to, 
to oh, you we course. can't go down yeah. so I think nearly everyone's had their jabs now in the staff and we are hoping from September we can start trying to get back to normality again which means we're all working from the the main library the public library section at the moment so we can't have anybody in um, but when we can all go back downstairs again we're very much hoping that we can reopen again to visits. Absolutely I just there was a question um, on the chat about are you how accessible when you are open do you, you do have to be an RHS member to? No, no not at all. Lovely. It's, Member benefit is that you can borrow from the modern lending collection. So if you're not a member, you can't take anything away with you. That's really what it comes down to. Um, anyone can see the lovely illustrations and your. Yep. Anyone yeah. can um, visit us as a researcher. We will ask you to register, but you don't have to be a member. Anyone can pop into the library upstairs when we're open, <laughs> can pop into the library upstairs and browse the collections that we have there. That's our modern lending collection. So from about 1970 to today. Um, and we do open up to tours. So this, as you said earlier, was going to be a, an actual tour in the library to look at the collections. And we do have different talks and tours that we can do as well. OK, that's super. I'll just grab another couple of questions. Um, David says, excellent talk. Thank you. When did the Horticultural Society become the Royal Horticultural Society? It became royal, I'm going to say 1852. I haven't noted it down, but it was to do with the, um, the rebuilding of uh, South Kensington as the Albertopolis with the museums and everything opening around there. The RHS um, got the Prince Consort as a patron and they basically said would you like to have a very lovely garden in amongst all these museums and he said yes. So the garden, the Kensington Garden for the RHS was actually located um, pretty much on that street that divides the, the I think it's the Science Museum and the V&A, it was around that area um, that has been built over, it wasn't just the yeah. It wasn't just the size of the street, it's also been taken over by the museums um, because they they moved out before it all really kicked off. They were there while this place was being built and actually if you take, you know that foot tunnel from South Kensington's tube, if you take that through to museums that actually ended at the RHS Kensington Garden. That was the idea, it would take you through to all the things that you could branch off at and end up in the garden. But before that was even completed they, they'd moved out from there again. But because of the involvement with that and Prince Albert, they were given the Royal Horticultural Society title. Okay, that's great. Um, Anthony says, wonderful talk, Susan, thank you so much. Can you say anything more about the way the, that books were collected and the reason it's called the Lindley Library? Yes, well, the library started out as soon as it had members, people brought materials along and that was stored. And there is somewhere in the council minutes where they say, oh, we've got a shelf of books now for our library. But it built up and up over time. It, I believe it did buy certain things at auction, but it's mainly member donations and books that they um, produce themselves. Then in about the 1840s, the society um, had very bad financial troubles and basically was selling everything off that it could. And that included the library. It all, it all went, it all went. Um, and, but the sad thing is, just as they had already committed to the auction of the library, their finances actually took a turn for the better. <laughs> and so they had to watch this library go and then start again from scratch. And the way they did that is that when John Lindley died, he had a massive library on botany, horticulture, art, everything. And they bought the whole library from the family and said this will be the start of our library again because that's why it's called the Lindley Library is it was a restarting of the library collections. We have managed to buy back over the hundred odd years some of the original items from the collections and that actually includes Hooker's Fruits, they were sold as well um, but we did manage to get those back. Um, I can't remember if they were gifted or if we had to purchase them but that, but that was a long long time ago but they came back to us. So yeah. Okay, brilliant. How many items are in the library and what proportion are digitised? Oh, <laughs> I've got a number, thousands, thousands, hundreds of thousands of items. Um, the digitisation, we are slowly picking up. It is it's very expensive to digitise. Um, sadly, it's, it really does need a lot of um, money and funding to do that. 
and that typically comes from donations um, to us or if you win things like um, lottery heritage funding that kind of thing. So the digitization mainly focuses on the art collection rather than the books. There are a few books that have been digitized um, that are very unique to the collection. One of those is the account book of Capability Brown. Um, he didn't leave very much in writing behind. He wasn't like Repton who produced all these wonderful books and works and published everything. And so that has been digitized and you can find that on the library website as well. Um, I'm sorry to say that small percentage has been digitized. Um, they're not available to the public yet, but we are working behind the scenes to go live with an archive catalog. We have an online library catalog of printed books, which you can already access, but we are working to release a catalog on, it's called Calm, which if you go to any other institution, that's typically what they have as well. And that will hold the archives and the art collection. And with the art collection, we would like to have a digitized thumbnail with each image so you know what you're looking at. Um, but that is a work in progress, but hopefully not too far away. That sounds good. Yes, I realise it's very expensive digitising. Um, I'll just read this from Chris. Um, it's interesting to reflect how gardening is changing, particularly the deeply double dug vegetable beds in the wartime <laughs> leaflet. Charles Dowding promotes no dig vegetable growing, which is certainly a lot easier on the back and leaves much time for more interesting tasks than digging. This is now being adopted in farming where much less deep ploughing takes place and the ground is simply harrowed. Less interference with the soil structure is beneficial to wildlife and particularly to the millions of worms who have been scared off our fields and gardens or exterminated by deep digging and ploughing. Yeah, thanks for that, Chris. Yeah. Anything to add to that, Susan? Um, he's quite right. <laughs> he's quite right. There is an upsurge at the moment. We get little trends in the, in the library that you can see in the collections that are gathered. And no dig gardening, that is something that's only up at the moment. More requests for books like that to come in. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, Mike Marriott, very interesting, great illustrations. Um, I just, one comment myself, um, amazing that Bernari was a seed merchant and just happened to be a fantastic artist as well. <laughs> They are be they are beautiful. They're not exactly true to life, but they they yeah. do the job. So yeah. they're very nice. Yes, yeah. I really like the um, government coffee inquiry. That yeah. was really good. <laughs> and your the health and safety diagram of the pruning of the tree. Yeah. And do you know anything about Monty Don's ancestor? Oh, at the top of my head, I don't know a great deal. Um, but he there was a group of people in the early days the RHS paid to travel all over the world and collect things to Japan, the Americas, um, Africa for Mon uh, Monty Don, for George Don and um, we do have in the collections in the archives the plant hunter journals, they're called plant collectors now, they used to be called plant hunters but it's now collectors and we do have his works in there so we had an exhibition a few years ago about the plant hunters and I'm sure that's something that's going to end up coming going online as well. That's something we've been trying to do. The exhibitions that we can't show at the moment in the library, which are quite small, but interesting. Um, we're trying to create them as digital um, exhibitions that you can access for free via the website. Mm -hmm. That's that's it, I think, on the questions. Thank um, you. Jules, Jules, I wonder, is Victor still? Um, oh, he is. Yes, actually, he's cool. Called. Um, because I just wonder, um, we, everyone uh, wonders ab about pineapples on public buildings, and you mentioned, Susan, the pineapples on Lambeth Bridge, which is our bridge in Th our bridge, well, <laughs> uh, Thorny Island um, Society, um, and I wondered if Victor had any more information about um, pineapples on Thorny Island. If He's just unmuting, I think. Oh. I'm not naming and shaming, Victor. Uh, Unmute. Okay, yeah, okay, can you hear me? Yeah, that's fine. I was, I was going to ask you a question anyway about, um, uh, you, there were some grapes there, 
and I was wondering what their new big vineyard down there uh, was. It one wondering what the the purpose of that, whether it was experimental or ev- revenue earning. But first of all, let me just get uh, the p- pineapple, as you mentioned there. They're uh, on the top of um of Lambeth Bridge, also in St John's Church at the top. And once you start looking out for pineapples, they are in a lot of places. I don't know the, the railings in front of the Royal Hospital have all got little black <coughs> black pineapples at the top. Uh, uh, Christopher Wren was nuts about them. Uh, the, 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 the St Paul's Cathedral around doesn't have crosses, it has pineapples. And he, uh, there are some stories that you actually wanted to put a pineapple on the very top, but he was <coughs> dissuaded from doing that. And there are other churches that are in Harker where you see these huge, great, great some um, stone pineapples are lying around because, of course, so, uh, they were extremely expensive and uh, often nobles' tables, uh, but they were a, a symbol of hospitality, which is why there, there are so many around in front of front of a of, how, of houses on on railings but do you know anything about the role of the of the vineyard is it a is it part of the exper- experiments or is it just to make wine and make money do you mean the vineyard at um chiswick at wisley isn't it oh at wisley the one at wisley um i don't know the current vineyard they do make wine i believe they do make wine from the grapes at wisley whether they sell it or they Give it away to you special people. I don't know. Because yeah. I'm based well, in London, I'm afraid. I don't get to walk around the gardens at Wisley very much. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was a lovely talk. Thank you. That's okay. Uh, David's just added that the Wimbledon men's trophy also has a pineapple on the top. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, I was fascinated too about the naming and shaming. Um, yeah, you have so much to learn, really, from the RHS in terms of how we how we sell anything to the public or how commercial development and growers um, market and sell to the public, um, and keeping the um, the prestige um, and the name of a product, whether it's coffee or fruit or a vegetable, so that it is what it says on the the tins i mean where do you think that philosophy came from so early on really in this whole process um with the coffee i think the main thing that made the government want to do something was they were losing revenue <laughs> so it was um i mean it all was on as well public health is obviously a very big motivator in the 19th century and it wasn't just coffee there's if you um read any any reports history books about London 19th century the food was shocking it's surprising not more people died and one way that you they could try and it was name and shame one way they could try and stop this was via science and the quote that I read out from Lindley is from uh, in reply to a letter that he received from James Wood who um, I couldn't find out his actual position but he, he's working for the Lancet as well as the government And he said, what do you think is the best way that we could find to identify adulteration in coffee? But I think they also did other reports in mustard and things like that in many, many products. And he came back saying, I think the microscope's good enough. But there is an article online that I found but couldn't read all of it. Um, Say, looking back on this and saying, is that the best way to have done things at that time? Where was science in terms of identifying Um, products and materials by using chemical analysis Um, but that wasn't really available at that time it wasn't available to John Lindley so he got his microscope out and yeah it kind of a job well done I think with that Um, one comment here by Chris Um, here in North Wiltshire we have three ac- and three acre vineyard up the road. Last night, the Devon and Cornwall programme featured the vineyard on St. Martin's in the Isles of Sis- Scilly. Two and a half acres, which we had the joy of walking past last mm-hmm. month. Okay, nice one, Chris. Mm-hmm. Sure, that was lovely. I watched the programme as well. And the wonderful handing over of the old people who wanted to retire to, the, to a, a young couple who lived in Yorkshire, I think, and just upped and packed up and went off to learn how to make wine. It was really nice. Mm. Nottingham. Mm. Okay. Oh, that's terrific. Um, 
if no one else has any more questions, we, um, as, as you know, we put together uh, an email and send out to everyone who's attended the talk and there will be a copy of um, Susan's um, talk and the illustrations today. But if, if anyone has any questions when you think about it and, and mull it over, um, please send them to Jules or myself and I'm sure Susan will answer them so that we can make them more generally available. <coughs> um, but before I um, ask everyone to uh, unmute to thank you in the normal way. It just occurs to me that the Thorny Island Society is very much like the RHS and I'm sure that will perhaps be somewhat shocking because we accept donations. <laughs> <laughs> we welcome donations of books to our collection in the archives, especially on Thorny Island. And also we're beginning to digitize our collection. We do have a, a corporate uh, sponsor um, so that's a process in which we haven't yet started, but we're on our way. So and it's rather nice to draw the evening to conclusion by saying there are similarities between our voluntary organisation, which we're very proud. But may I ask everyone to um, unmute to give Susan a thank you and to say I look forward to seeing everyone for my Marriott's talk on the 29th of July. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, thank you so much. Very enjoyable.